Thank you, Brother Brindley, for that fine reading. I would imagine that most of you are aware by now that we are not following the bulletin with scripture or people. Let me say, first of all, greetings and God bless all the mothers among us. I am indebted to two mothers in my life for what I am today and what I am enjoying from the Lord, and that is my own mother and the mother of my children. For they both have helped me greatly with self-esteem and with my walk with Jesus. I will not be sharing with you what may be concerned a traditional Mother's Day sermon. It is not what the Lord laid on my heart. A few weeks ago, a sermon began to form in my mind for some reason. And I share that with you from the book of Hebrews. The text which Beverly just read to us, contains several verses which are a quote from the man David. David understood that he was not limited to only natural understanding of life. As a young man, he had chosen to think positively about life as he was the youngest of eight boys. He was, as I would understand it, left with the worst job, watching the sheep, not considered a great opportunity in life. I can understand a bit, I am the youngest of four. I remember griping and moaning and groaning and being negative about the reality when I realized that I would be stuck with all those jobs that my brothers had passed on from one to the other until they came to the last one. I was left to help mom more than any of them ever did. I had to hoe the garden and do all those things, and I discovered something great in life one day, that one could take their mind and move other places while they're doing menial jobs. <laughs> and it was during that time that I developed a sense of humor, which carried me through my teenage years and has messed me up in other times. <laughs> We find David watching those flocks, and as he observes the atmosphere around him, and as far as he can see, he recognizes that there is more exist than just what is visible. He looks into the heavens, and what does he see? He sees at nighttime the moon, and at daytime the sun, the sun, the moon, and the stars, and he observes all of that, but he already knows there is someone beyond that, and that is God. And he says, when I consider the sun, the moon, and the stars, and all that God has created, it's awesome. God has a whole lot more than just human beings. And now that we are in an advanced time since then and understand a bit more about space and planets and galaxies and all of that. We know that God has a whole lot more he can enjoy. But when David looks into the heavens, what does he see? He sees the glory of God, which is Beyond, his mind is invaded with a supernatural God which carries him in this natural world. He also understands, if you go to the 8th Psalm, that somehow God is strengthened or honored and enjoys when a baby cries. 
that gives him encouragement and he begins to understand a revelation God gives him that we all need to understand that there is an order of authority among the created beings of God. He understands that the angels have their realm of authority and place, and they are first. But next to angels are these people we call human beings. It's us, and we are not created here to just do what we think or do what we feel like, but we have a position of authority that all the rest of creation is under us, and we are responsible for it as well as the earth in which we live. And David takes that authority seriously in his vocation as a shepherd and as a human being, and he has developed a relationship with God. Not only do we see the great supernatural things that he does, and I'll mention a few of them in a moment, but we also understand as we read the Psalms that here is a man, as God calls him, with a heart after God. Him and God had a good thing going. They related. God spoke to him, he spoke to God. He expressed when he was down, he says, oh soul, why are you down? Yet as my soul is down and I'm feeling depressed, I will praise the Lord because I know I can. But in one of the Great things that we observe, he is standing before King Saul because he has just bragged about what he can do. He was sent to visit his brothers in the army, take some goodies from home to encourage them. And while he is there, there is this man from the enemy side makes a big showing and dares anyone from Israel to come and fight him. The man is almost 10 foot tall. His name is Goliath, and he is mean and ugly. And David is astounded that no one is taking him on because this man dares to defy the God of Israel, the God that he knows personally. I want you to understand something. David knows he does not have to resort only to natural ability. When he is anointed with oil as king, as recorded in 1 Samuel 16, verse 13, it says after that anointing with oil and that calling of God, the Spirit of God moved upon him mightily at times. He knew he was equipped to take on a giant. And King Saul calls him in because he has questioned the military men of might and valor, why they're not fighting this man. And they make fun of him for him even thinking that one of them could whip him. And he says, if you're not going to do it, I will do it. King Saul hears about it. He comes before King Saul, and King Saul says, Do you realize, son, what you're trying to get into? This man has been practicing. He is a man of military might. Look at him. And what do you have, and what experience do you have? And David says, I have experience. For I took my place in God's order over my sheep to protect my sheep. And when a bear came and stole one of my sheep, I went and took that sheep out of his mouth and I killed him. A lion did likewise and with the lion, I grabbed him by the beard, took the sheep out of his mouth and killed him. 
Now, I want you to know, King Saul, that that man is defying the God that gives me the ability to take my position here on earth as a human being, and he is defying my God. And my God is bigger than him, although I may be small in appearance, and I do not have military experience, that guy is dead. And we know the rest of the story. He died. I move now to the book of Hebrews to help us in our understanding further of who we are. As New Testament Christians in this era, after the quote, which I just referred to in Psalm 8, the writer of Hebrews makes this statement. Yes, man was given this position of power and authority and all things under his feet. But now we see not all things under his feet. Mike, could you get me a drink of water? We see not all things under his feet. I ask you for a moment to consider the realm of humanity right here in Waynesboro and the rest of the world. Does it look like things are under our feet or are on top of our heads? How many would agree that it has turned upside down? And we are struggling to keep above it. We struggle with our minds to try and figure it out. We complain about the times in which we live and the authorities that are trying to rule with human ability and military might only. And the writer of the Hebrews takes us to a person we are to focus on. Now we see not all things under man, but we see who, tell me. Come on. Who? Who? That's good. We see Jesus, and then he goes on to tell us and remind us, who became one of us, lived a perfect life, and by doing so was crucified, and in his crucifixion he took all sin upon him and everything the devil has to offer and completely defeated Satan for all humanity. And as a result of that, Jesus said to his disciples, after they were following him and so impressed with all that Jesus as a person could do, he said, I'm leaving you. But I'm not leaving you comfortless. I am sending the comforter who will lead you all into all truth and who will give you the power to live on this earth that is upside down in victory over death and all that Satan has to offer. So we understand that from the supernatural are two powers, one of evil, one of good and might and godliness, and at the head of those powers are two persons. One, Satan, who came from the top of the angelic realm, the realm that is above us, an authority in that realm, defied God, was cast out of heaven. Adam opened the door by his choosing and allowed him to put the human race under his authority. And wherever human beings allow that to happen, he can rule, he can disturb, he can invade, he can mess it up, and he's done a good job of that. That's why we're under 
But Jesus Christ in his love, compassion, mercy, grace, submitted himself to the body of one of us, a human being, lived a perfect life, was put on a cross, and I repeat again, experienced everything that Satan can do in the negative to any human being. If an army is to win a battle, they have won by taking on all the oppositions, artillery, force, and power, and conquered it. And that's what Jesus did. And now we see Jesus crowned in a position, the highest position of authority in the universe. We see him crowned with glory and honor. And in his love and mercy and power and strength, he opens his arms to each of us as individuals and says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lonely, and you shall have rest unto your souls. We are living in a time of turmoil, of confusion, an invasion of Satan's powers, a time like no other around the world. Yet those that are coming to Jesus are beginning to understand something great and marvelous. I was sharing with a friend the other day, he was sharing with me, who had just connected with an organization that is spreading the gospel throughout many African countries, and Muslims by the hundreds are turning to Jesus. He was sharing with me the curriculum that they give them, and in that curriculum, they make it clear. If you come to Jesus and accept him, you may be killed. It's clear. You definitely can almost count on it that you will be persecuted. They teach them that. And yet, people are finding that it's worth it all. And many are dying at this moment and giving their lives to Jesus Christ and suffering for it. That's what I'm talking about. They see Jesus their Savior and Lord, and recognize something that we all must recognize, that this life here is just the beginning of forever, forever for each one of us. We all are aware that three of our dear ones have just left this world Richard, Joan, and Andy, but they are in the next phase of forever. And to us, we hear the words of Paul who says, in this, excuse me, it's Jesus who says, in this world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome this world. And Paul says, we do not grieve at those that have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, he will take us to be with himself. I am a little envious this morning of Richard, Joan, and Andy. They are in the little presence of Jesus Christ. Because here on this earth, they saw Jesus, accepted him, attempted their best to walk with him. And when this body gave out for them, they moved on, just like you and I did. We see Jesus as we grieve in life. We see Jesus conquering all evil. 
We see Jesus giving us the power and the authority and the wisdom to live our daily lives in victory. In all the great things and the drama that we see in the life of David, I think the greatest thing that we discover, as he has written in many psalms, and that is the quietness of his soul and the peace that God gives. There was a time in my Christian life when I sought the drama because I believed that God, knowing that God could do miracles, I wanted to see miracles. But I think the greatest miracle I have experienced is that every day I can experience the quietness and peace and presence of the Holy Spirit bringing me to Jesus. We see him in his strength in this hour because we personally have the opportunity to let him come into our lives and rule and reign. Yes, it's difficult in the natural. Yes, he will take us out of our comfort zones. But yes, he will give us authority over Satan. Not only in our own lives, but in those around us. Our neighbors, our friends, our families, we can pray for. And yes, he hears our prayers. We see Jesus. And let's live with his peace and power and strength in our lives. Till he calls us home to be with our dear ones, where we will see them all and see him face to face. God bless you. Jim gave a good introduction to the next song. This is a song that's very familiar to most people. And we're going to kind of dedicate to all the moms, the grandmothers, all the ladies in their lives that have passed on. And maybe it's a special aunt or whoever. Will the circle be unbroken? And I encourage each of you on the chorus when you get to it, help us sing. Will the circle be unbroken? Will the circle be unbroken by and by, Lord, by and by? There's a better home awaiting in the sky, Lord, in the circle be unbroken by and by lord by and by there's a better home awaiting in the sky lord in the circle be unbroken by and by lord by and by there's
there's a better home awaiting in the sky, Lord, in the sky. I went back home, Lord, my home was lonesome, missed my mother, she was gone. My brothers, sisters crying, what a home so sad and alone. Everybody. Will the circle be unbroken by and by, Lord, by and by? There's a better home awaiting in the sky, Lord. 